So welcome again. Our topic is the auditory pathway. The auditory pathway is a pathway that allows for hearing to take place. And it is broadly divided into two. We have the peripheral auditory pathway and we have the central auditory pathway. The peripheral auditory pathway occurs within the ear, while the central auditory pathway occurs within the central nervous system. So in the peripheral auditory pathway, the sound wave from the external environment, before they go to the central nervous system where interpretation will take place, they need to pass through the peripheral system. And there are reasons for this. The sound wave from the external environment will pass through three sub-regions, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The functions of the peripheral auditory pathway, the sound wave needs to pass through the peripheral auditory pathway before it gets to the central auditory pathway. There are sub-regions that helps to feed the central nervous system stimuli for it to interpret. So apart from that, they also help to convert sound wave to neural stimuli. So as they go from one region to the other, there's a form of modification that they are being subjected to. So let's take a look at the different regions of the peripheral auditory pathway and see the kind of activity that goes on within them. So the first one is the outer ear. The outer ear is made up of the pinna and the auditory canal or the external acoustic meatus. We actually have an internal acoustic meatus after the inner ear. The pinna is the visible part of the ear, is on the outside, we can see it. And what it is made up of is the elastic cartilage. This elastic cartilage run in spiral expanded pattern so it's like a funnel shaped structure. And this expansion allows for it to accommodate as much sound wave as it can, then direct it towards the hair canal. So this is the expansion. Then you have the hair canal, which is a constriction. So you have expansion and constriction. When you direct sound wave through a narrow path, you see that the volume tends to increase. So there is a form of amplification in this region. And that is what the outer ear does, amplification of sound wave, because they run from an expanded region to a narrow path. So you have the pinna, you have the ear canal, and this is like a barricade, the limit of the outer ear, and this is called the eardrum. So we'll see this in a subsequent slide. Let's go to the middle ear. The middle ear is the central portion of the ear. It is located between the outer ear and the inner ear. The middle ear is a hair filled cavity. This is the hair drum seen at the terminal end of the ear canal. So it marks the limit of the outer ear. So from this region down to this region, we now have the middle ear. So the function of the middle ear is that it helps to transmit sound wave from the outer ear to the inner ear. Its major structural components are three ossicles. The smallest bone in the human body arranged in form of a lever, which means that they are attached at one end to the other. So you have three of them. We have the malleus, we have the incus, and we have the steps. This is the way they run. And through this process, the wave information travels via this series of delicate bone. The form of sound wave that we have coming from the outer ear is now being transformed to a mechanical vibration. Through this liver formation, is able to convert them into mechanical wave. They are now being transferred into the inner ear, but the middle ear and the inner ear is separated by two windows. We have the oval window on top and we have the round window below. So these tapes rest on the oval window. Why a bit inferior to the oval window, we have the round window. The round window is not connected to any bone. In the oval window, there is further amplification of sound. This tends to go like 10 times in folds of what we have before. So what the round window does, when there is transmission of mechanical sound wave into the inner ear through the oval window, the round window vibrates. And the vibration tends to expand the mechanical energies just to further support the amplification that is generated at the oval window. So the two still work hand in hand. The inner ear is a fluid filled cavity, which means that it is occupied with fluid unlike in the middle year where we have the space filled with hair. And the major events that occur in the inner is the conversion of the mechanical sound wave that is being generated in the middle year to neural impulses. And this is what the brain understands. So from this point in the inner year, the next target is now is the central auditory pathway, which is going to the brain. In the inner year, we have the bony labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth. 
subdivided into three. We have the cochlea, we have the vestibule, we have the semicircular canal. These structures are membranous and caved in the bone within this region. So this is the cochlea, this is the semicircular canal, this is the vestibule. So the vestibule tends to connect the cochlea with the semicircular canal. Then we have the osteous labyrinth. The osteous labyrinth is also made up of the osteous cochlea, the osteous semicircular canal, and the osteous vestibule. You can see that they have similar name. This is because the membranous labyrinth, you can see their structure and the way they are patterned. This is the same pattern that you see in the bones that they are embedded into. So that is why we have the membranous cochlea, we also have the osteous cochlea because they have the same configuration. It's just that one is membranous and one is bony. And the membranous are actually embedded within the bone. So that's the way the structure is configured. Out of these three substructures in the inner ear, the cochlea is the main structure that is responsible for hearing. The semicircular canal and the vestibule are related to equilibrium and balance. Let's take a deeper look on the cochlea. We've said that the cochlea is the auditory portion of the inner ear. It is filled with fluid. The name of the fluid that is contained within it is the endolymph. Why the perilymph separates the membranous cochlea from the osteous cochlea is just to further reduce friction and to protect the membranous cochlea. So the way the cochlea is being structured is like a long coid or spiral structure. And that is the way the waves are being propagated. So they run through that structure like that. Trying to look a bit deeper on the cochlea, when we cut the section, we're able to see three distinct features. And we have the scalar vestibule, which lies superiorly. We have the scalar tympani, which lies inferiorly. And we have the scalar media from the name, the middle, which is at the center. So you can see these three compartments, one at the upper part, one at the lower part, and one at the middle. The one at the upper part, which is the scalar vestibule, links with the oval window. Remember our image that we showed in our previous slides that the limb of the staves rest on the oval window. So this is where the oval window is, and this is where the middle ear has a connection with the inner ear. It is through the scalar vestibule. Then we have the round window. The round window links the scalar tympani below, while at the center we have the scalar media located between the vestibule and the tympani. The distinct feature about the scalar media is that it is within this space that we have the specific organ that is responsible for hearing. Let's take a look at the organ of Corti. What is the organ of Corti? This is locally referred to as the body's own microphone. And in the scalar media is where you have this organ of Corti. This organ of Corti are specialized structures that are actually responsible for generating neural impulses. The sound wave that comes from the middle ear is being taken off by this region and being transformed into neural impulses. This is the basement membrane of the scalar media. And on top of the basement membrane is where we have this organ of corti. So how is the mechanical sound energy transformed into neural impulses? We said that we have two major windows separating the middle ear from the inner ear. This is the oval window and the round window. The mechanical sound wave that is being generated in the middle ear, the middle ear is somewhere around here, enters through the scalar vestibule. There's a vibration below in the oval window. And this vibration tends to stimulate the organ of corti within the scalar media to vibrate. And when they vibrate, they are being able to transform the mechanical impulse to neural impulses. So let's go a bit further to see the characteristics of this organ of corti. What is it made up of? Well, it is made up of basically columnar type of cell. On the free surface, we have cilia. There are specialized cilia, and this is referred to as sterocilia. We also have other type of cells in the organ of corti, but these are supporting cells. How does the generated neural impulse from the organ of corti then being transported to the brain? That means they need the connection of a neuron. So again, this is our configuration. This is the outer ear, the middle ear, the inner ear. This is the ostation tube that connects the middle ear 
to the nasopharynx. So after the generation of the neural impulses, we have collection of neurons that are coming to synapse to the generating cell that generates the neural stimuli. So they collect it, but these neurons are pseudo unipolar neuron. They have the cell body and they have two extensions. So the axons are divided into two. One of them connects to the generating cell and the other one is directing it to the central nervous system. So impulses are being taken off from this region by synapse where neurotransmitter glutamate communicates the signals that is being generated to this axon. So a collection of nerves that receives the generated neural impulses are called the cochlear nerve. So this is where the cochlear nerve synapses on, on the organ of corti. And of course, it's taking it to the central nervous system where interpretation will take place. This cochlear nerve does not move alone. Remember the eight cranial nerve, which is the vestibular cochlear nerve. And remember when we talked about the subregions in the inner ear, we said the cochlear, the semicircular canal, and the vestibule. So the vestibule is where the vestibular cochlear nerve originate from. These are not actually responsible for hearing. We say that what they do basically are maintaining balancing and equilibrium. So nerves are also being taken off from this region and they merge with the cochlear nerve to form the vestibular cochlear nerve and they run together to enter into the central nervous system. But we would be focusing on just the cochlear because the aim of this lecture is the hearing process. So we have a head cranial nerve now taking the generated and the packaged stimuli to the brain where interpretation will take place. So this is the peripheral pathway. You can see how the sound waves have been taken from the external environment through the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And of course, as they go down, there are different forms of transformation before we are finally able to arrive at the neural stimuli that the brain can actually understand. And this is taken up by the cochlear nerve. So from here, we would enter into the central auditory pathway, going through the brain for interpretation. We are going to start with the configuration of the brain. We have the cerebral hemisphere up here. Of course, in the cerebral hemisphere, we have different regions. We have the frontal lobe, we have the parietal, we have the temporal. So the temporal will be somewhere around here on both sides. Then we have the thalamus. The thalamus is situated between the cerebral hemisphere and the midbrain. So this is the midbrain, this is the pond, this is the medulla, and this is the spinal cord. And we have the cochlea somewhere around here. In the cochlea, we already have the neural impulses being generated by the organ of corti. And this is taken directly to the cochlear nuclei. The cochlear nuclei are located around the medulla. They are separated into two regions. We have the ventral cochlea and the dosa cochlear nuclei. So the first point where they connect to is the cochlear nuclei. We already know that nuclear collection of cell bodies within the central nervous system. When they are outside central nervous system, they are called ganglion. So there's a synapse here. The cochlear nuclei on the ipsilateral side. So we have this structure on this side too, where the cochlear nerve will also synapse on the cochlear nuclei in the medulla. It's ipsilaterally, they are not crossing. The right here, we synapse on the right cochlear nuclei in the medulla. The left ear, we synapse on the left cochlear nuclei in the medulla. So after synapsing the medulla on the cochlear nuclei, most of the fibers will cross to the contralateral side to synapse on the superior olivary nucleus. The superior olivary nucleus are located between the junction of the medulla and the pons. So most of them will cross to the contralateral side. Why the remaining? we run to the superior olivary nucleus on the same side. So this event will also occur in the other side. And this allows for bilateral form of hearing because you have group of neurons, most of them crossing to the other side, the other one maintaining. Hearing we say is bilateral because of the formation that is formed around this region. So you can stay here and talk and still hear from the other side. So after synapsing the superior olivary nucleus, the fibers then run upward to the inferior colliculus in the midbrain, 
from the inferior colliculus in the midbrain, they enter into the medial geniculate nucleus in the thalamus. We've said that thalamus are relay station. We have a lot of nuclei in the thalamus where neurons are relayed onto before they finally terminate on the cerebral cortex. So they are relayed to the medial geniculate nucleus in the thalamus. Then from there, they now terminate onto the cerebral cortex around the temporal region because that is where you have the auditory cortex located. So also on the other side, they go through the inferior colliculus in the midbrain, medial geliculate body in the thalamus, then finally they now terminate on auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. There is an acronym that we can use to remember this part. Equima E is the eighth cranial nerve, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve. The C is the cochlear nuclei. The O is the olivary nucleus, but we should remember that it is the superior olivary nucleus. Then we have the inferior colliculus. We have the medial geniculate nucleus and we have the auditory cortex. Then the auditory cortex, we say that they are located in the temporal lobe. This is the entire cerebral cortex. This is the frontal region, parietal, hospital, and the temporal. So it is on the temporal that we have the primary auditory cortex, specifically on the superior temporal gyros. Remember a sulci and a gyra. The sulci are like indentation, while the gyra are like elevation. So the primary auditory cortex is located on the gyros that is superiorly located on the temporal bone. So this is where the final termination occurs. We also have a secondary auditory cortex. What this distinguishes is the localization of the sound and also analysis of complex sound. So you can detect whether the sound is coming from a far place or a near place. And this secondary auditory cortex are regions around the primary auditory cortex painted in blue. So it actually surrounds the primary auditory cortex. We also have a descending auditory pathway. This pathway is not well understood. It is assumed that the same pattern through which the auditory pathway are sent from the organ of cortex to the auditory cortex, we also have a similar pathway that run in a descending form. The function of this descending auditory pathway is that it helps to send inhibitory signals to the hair cells, which are the cells that are specifically responsible for the generation of neural impulses. So it helps to control their damage and also help to protect them against noise-induced damages or other form of damage. Clinical anatomy, deafness, this is very common. It's a partial or a total loss of the ability to hear. It may be unilateral or bilateral. That means it can affect one ear or both. And it could occur as a result of infection. So you have a congenital disease, disease that occur as a result of malformation of the development of form. So they are born with it or environmental factor. You're always exposed to loud noise. This can damage the organ of corti. Also age. Treatments are basically with antibiotics. You can use hearing aid or even surgery as the case may be, depending on the cause. We have tympanoplasty. Tympanoplast has to deal with the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum. This tympanoplasty is like a surgical procedure that is used to fix a hole or a tear. So if there is a hole or a damage on the eardrum, tissue are drafted from other part of the body and they are used to cover the damaged area. So question time. First question is for us to describe the peripheral auditory pathway. We said that the peripheral auditory pathway helps to modify the sound wave that comes from the external environment. The second one is to explain the central auditory pathway. And the last one is to describe the structure or the morphology of the organ of cutting and link with the cochlear nerve. So thanks for spending your time watching. Let's continue to upgrade through this channel.